This is the second half of um, a two-part um, seminar, really. And uh, the first part, just by way of recap, um, we, we looked at the, um, the sexual revolution and, and we noted that we are immersed in, we are living in one of the most profound and far-reaching social and cultural revolutions uh, of, of recent times. And this is impacting profoundly, not only on our society, but on our family, on our ministry, and indeed on our own hearts. And it is shaping the way we feel and think at a subconscious as well as a conscious level. We noted too that, that we Christians, we've always found it hard to talk about this issue. Uh, because of a shame culture that we have both inherited from the fall, but also that's been perpetuated in the church. And we noted too that the, the revolution is powered by a number of factors, but particularly the power of story. It has a, a compelling story. And it's a simple story of freedom, of liberation, and particularly liberation from what is viewed as the rules and the constraints of the old Christian order. And we noted that we all know that it is much more complicated than this simple story of freedom. There is a philosophic analysis in terms of the history of ideas that, that says this revolution is if you want to understand it, you need to understand Gnosticism, you need to understand queer theory, you need to understand cultural Marxism. And so we, we all agreed that it is much more complicated than, than this simple message of freedom which we talked about. But, but then we noted that that, in a way, is the secret of its power. Because the people out there, they don't know about cultural Marxism or queer theory or Gnosticism, but they do know that the way to be free is to follow your heart and to be yourself and to look within and be authentic. Because that's everywhere around us. And that is what we are told and this is what people believe at some level. And so, after noting the power of story, we, we, we noted that this is a story that, that's not only told, it, it's a story that has become embodied in culture. And it's recruited what Peter Berger, the sociologist, called the plausibility structures of social life to support it, this simple idea of freedom. Plausibility structures, remember, are those social and cultural artifacts which we surround ourselves with and which also tell a story. And we looked at the picture in Banks in England which says, he said yes and two men embracing. And we said if you're a Martian, you would think that those two men embracing is He's so happy with his friend because he could open the bank account. But, but actually, it, it's the bank just signalling its support for what is assumed to be a shared value in our society between all right-thinking people, and that's gay marriage. He said yes. So the bank doesn't need to say this is a message about gay marriage. There are no words on it, just two people. He said yes. And so if you... If the Martian says to you, what is that about? Is that about opening a bank account? That's why everyone's so happy. You'd say, no, it's not about that. It's a long story. And it started a few years back and, and then we'd tell him the story. But the point is, this story is now iconized. It's, it's inserted itself into culture so that the artifacts of culture tell the story as well. And so it's entering into our worldview at a subconscious level and shaping our feelings as well as our thinking so that we not only think it's true, you just need to be yourself. We, f we want it to be true. 
because we want to belong to this culture we want to be on the right side of history anybody want to be on the wrong side of history here depends what you mean by that but people just don't do a lot of thinking but they we are pattern matchers as human beings we haven't got time to to analyze everything imagine if any anybody use TripAdvisor here to, to find out which hotel to book now imagine if every decision you make in life were like finding a hotel on TripAdvisor you know you put in where it is and then all the, and then you think well shall I rank it by price or by ratings I'll go for ratings so you rank it by ratings and there's five stars at the top and you say that's the one you start to read some of the reviews five star five. then there's one star the receptionist was terrible oh maybe maybe that's going downhill so let's go to the next one and the next and you work now you land on a hotel then you discover it's too far from the airport so you've got to start all over again so imagine if every if every decision were were like that and there is a very rare neurological condition which snips a bit of the brain a kind of a tiny stroke so that every decision is that process everything is highly thought through and rationalistic there's no intuition at work no gut instincts everything has to be logically analyzed and worked out now so you'd say that's brilliant if you have this neurological snip this disconnect between your feelings and your thinking everything becomes logical in your life and you make all the kind of balanced wise decision the reality is people are frozen or they make crazy decisions because there's too much information to analyze every day and so we are pattern matchers most of the decisions we make we look for the pattern around us and kind of go with that if it's not too important we take our cues from culture and we're we're terribly socially sensitive as creatures so we we want to know which way the wind is blowing culturally and, and we want to be part of what's perceived to be the values that all right-thinking people have around here will kind of go with that these are broad cultural trends but the point is the point is that this revolution has recruited culture to tell its own story freedom and and that is the the story we live in and it's the simplicity of that story its cultural embodiment its entry into the subconscious world of our instincts that that gives it such power and that makes us feel so powerless and the philosopher Charles Taylor as we if you remember and with this I finish my recap philosopher Charles Taylor said if you want to combat a great story it's no use responding with facts you've got to tell a different story you have to engage with the fact that as human beings we are as Alistair MacIntyre the moral philosopher Oxford said we are storytelling animals we structure the way we think about the world in terms of a story okay so who are you you say well I'm Joe Bloggs and tell me about yourself you say well I'm a doctor I'd love to know some more well I, I come from from uh, the deep south uh-huh help me understand tell me more well where do you want me okay well I was born in so and so you go back to the beginning and then just by default we begin to tell a story we are deeply storied creatures and uh, and so if you respond to a story with a list of facts it 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 doesn't have the same ability to engage our our natural way of being in the world it it kind of doesn't connect so we were left with this conundrum how do we how do we relate to this story out there uh, and we noted that you you can fight it and and you can deny it you can cave into it and enter into it or i suggested 
Uh, so you can cave into it and just accept its premises, its narrative, or you can enter into it and engage with its questions in order to tell your own story in response to it. And we said that that entry into the story of the world around us could be framed by an attitude, a posture, a psychological posture of, of being ready to say sorry where we need to say sorry. Um, th there are things that we need to acknowledge in our history as Christians that are not good. Just because you disagree with someone doesn't mean you're entirely right and they're entirely wrong. And it helps your relationship with them if you acknowledge, yeah, we got some things wrong. Some of the things you've shown me that Christians say, they're mean and they sound bigoted sometimes. So I'm sorry because I'm a Christian. I'm sorry they said that. And thank you for waking me up and thank you for showing me some good things as well. In this revolution, not everything is bad. There are some real lessons for us as Christians. When it confronts our shame and says, look, you can't bring your children up in ignorance. This power inside them, this holy fire, you, you, can't, you can't hope it'll all come right and, and not fulfill the obligations of a parent to shepherd your child's heart into what it means to be sexual in the image of God. So when it demands authenticity of us, even though we, we going on see its own answers are so defunct, so deficient, we should be grateful that it comes with the questions to us as well. And, and there are many things this revolution has done for women that we need to be thankful for, where it's exposed the oppression of women. And we need to say, thank you, you woke some of us up for that, because what we call complementarianism, and we'll defend complementarianism if we want to, but we called it that, but in our hearts it was just misogyny. Some of us like being up there. And ex so, again, thank you for kind of waking us up to the fact that we need to learn some things as well. And if it's, if it's truth, it's God's truth. And it doesn't matter if you've made in God's image, even though we're broken. If, if you've shared some truth with me, I want to say thank you for that. Now, what we're doing in this process, as we said, is two things. First, we're just following the instructions of our Lord. Before you start pulling out specks from other people's eye, you make sure that you're own. And, and, and we're, being, we're, we're, we're wanting to be real with people. So it's the right thing to do. But the other thing is, it's the smart thing to do. Because it subverts the narrative that you live in. The narrative is, the story is, you're the bigot, you don't understand, you're just out to protect your own rights, you're defensive, you don't want anything to change about yourself, and we're all, you think they're all wrong, you're right, and you're out there to defeat them, you see? Because you're really driven by a kind of bigotry. And, and that's the kind of, we have got to realize that that, do you remember we had the pictures of the elephants, the two elephants, and the little man, the men on top talking to each other, one says, five reasons why you're wrong, but they're both sitting on big elephants. And the elephants are the feelings bit that says, you annoy me, you really annoy me, the way you do that with your hands. And so they're not listening to your five reasons because they think you're a bigot. They don't, you know. and, and so what you try and do is subvert the story that you live in so that you, you, you don't appear the kind of person they think you are and you just be authentic yourself. And then we said, please, well, the reason please is because Paul, Peter, 3, 1, 1 Peter 3, 15, he says, be ready to give to be ready to give a defense of the hope that lies in you. How? With gentleness and respect. With gentleness and respect. With gentleness and respect. Let them feel your resolve. You will never, you will never give up this. But let them feel the strength of your resolve in your gentle confidence. 
And so please, can, I, can we talk about stories now, your story and mine? Can we get behind the slogans and the name calling? I'm not here, I'm not going to call you a name. I wonder whether you could, would be open to not calling me a name either. And we can have a, a, a sensible conversation that's, that gets to the truth of things. And so please, can we look at your promises? We've owned up to ours, some of our failed promises. How have yours worked out? You promised freedom. Are we any happier? There's no evidence of this. There's no evidence that the human spirit is prospering in Western culture as a result of expressive individualism. And then we said f flourishing. People are having less sex now than they were 50, 30 years ago. We noted how the trajectory is going down and so this freedom that, deliver, that promises more delivers less. And strangely in our culture, we are beginning to hedge sex around with rules and regulations. Don't touch. Have you filled out all the forms on child abuse? Have you, uh, don't, don't you touch me or look at me like, like that, you see? And so we're becoming very anxious about this thing. And strangely, in a culture that's having less sex, and that's becoming rule-bound in the way it thinks about sex, it's becoming a kind of an odd version of us, the way we get sometimes. You know, we, we give the appearance of having a problem with, with sex and just rules, and this culture's becoming a bit like that. You may want to comment on that or challenge me on it, that's fine, just an observation. So, what about your broken promises? Fairness. You know, fairness is about more than the rights of one section of the community. We Christians, we look on, on a bigger map of our duties to one another. What about our duties toward our children? In, in this culture, certainly in England, Wales, 2013, only one half of children reached the age of 16 with two parents in the home, only a half. This is unfair. It is unfair. We are visiting structural injustice on the most vulnerable in our society. And we're talking about fairness. And so we, we can begin to have a conversation that deals in truth and insists in truth. And then having exposed some of the <coughs> failed promises please and, and having talked about some of our failed promises please can we share what we what we've what we're coming to see is really our our true story of of what sex means why it's been given why as human beings we're we're like this and like all good stories it kind of starts at the beginning as we seek to relate to that story as we fall in alongside and try to connect with it, the area that we connect is what? I'd suggest it is identity. With this big fundamental foundational question of who are we? Everything flows in the sexual revolution from the notion that we are creatures who can define ourselves, who can identify ourselves you see and so if, if, if that is so fundamental in the story of the revolution then maybe that's a good place for us to connect with it because that's our story too who are we 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 deal in that currency as Christians and then just as this this revolution tells its story, I suggest that you connect with it by simply telling your personal story. So let me tell you mine in relation to this. Well, my story in many ways begins with this question, who am I? And uh, this is a revolution that says look inside yourself, and I've done that. And what do I find when I look inside myself? What do you find? You wake up in the morning and you look inside, what do you find? One day I find one thing, 
I find a sense of drive and readiness for the day and a sense of competence. And the next day I wake up and I, I find almost a sense of, of despair and, and gloom and pessimism. And I want to put the covers back over and go, this is true. This is a story that says be authentic. That is my story. I dare to suggest it's most of yours. And I, I look inside and as I keep the camera on that place, I, I find seeds of greatness there. I think I'm really good at some things. I really do. And I'm ready to own those things that I'm good at something, pretty lousy at others, but there are seeds of, of greatness in there as well. I am good at some things, but I, I find also seeds of terrible destruction. So I find seeds of the wanting to build up, but seeds of wanting to tear down, and I find meanness and greed and selfishness. And I, I find a shadow side when I come clean about myself that has its roots in hell. And so you're asking me to build my, the foundations of my identity on this inner world of shifting insecurities and doubts and fear and sin? Well, look, let me tell you my, my story. This story, you want, this is about authenticity, right? This is about the truth of what you find within. This is the truth I find within. This is my truth. Can I share my story? What's so interesting about this look within thing, you see, is it leads us into our Christian... We've always said, be honest about who you are. And, and be honest about what you find there. And you see, this, this um, snake oil, I used the term the other day, a term for quack medicines that was sold off the back of wagons in the Wild West as doctors went around and made money out of, out of these med snakes. This snake oil of expressive individualism, be yourself, doesn't work. It consigns us to a treadmill of endless self-making that is ultimately groundless. It invites us to go from nowhere to somewhere, but somewhere turns out to be anywhere. It is a rootless, shifting sand of self-invention. And if you remember, I told you about an experiment um, that I published at Dogs about in my first book, Ego Trip, which, which shows how when we attempt to assert our own worth, people who feel got low self-worth after trying to do that for six months, I'm special, I'm worthy, I attract people, they feel worse not better, because it's simply your own propaganda. And if the self is, struggles to, to define its own worth, how much more its own meaning, its own identity. And so I look back at my, my, my conversation partner, I say, you're seriously asking me to, okay, well, you asked me to be real, this is my reality, and I want to be real about that, and I do not believe that looking within has, gives a foundation on which to build my life. And yes, there are important things about what I find within, but I will never build a whole identity on those part identities, my nationality, I'm black, white, my sexuality, I'm gay, straight, my economic position, I'm a rich, I'm poor, I'll never be satisfied by building my sense of self on those part identities. My heart, this is my reality, we're still talking about realities. My heart cries for something bigger, more grounding. And that's my story. And I found myself tiring of <coughs> looking within myself. And I looked out to the stars and I said, will somebody name me? Is there anybody who knows who I am who will tell me? And in our Christian story, it's not so much that we found God, but he found us. It's not so much that 
we invited him into our story as he called us into his and the wonderful reality of being part of this faith that that says you don't have to make everything up God has revealed himself to us in Christ the word became flesh the wonderful part if you turn that coin over he's revealed himself to us turn that coin over on the other side and he's he's not only revealed who he is he's revealed to us who we are for as many as received him he gave the authority the right to call themselves children of God born not of human flesh but born of God we bear the image of God himself and so yeah that my, my story is that that image is broken and it's disfigured and at times it's ugly because I tried to do it my way but now because he came after me that image is being restored and remade and so in my story my identity <laughs> isn't something discovered in the self or constructed by the self it is a gift to the self image bearer I bear the image God himself and who I am the message of who I am comes from the stars it's from God himself and that is the identity in which I stand So, you might say, well, okay, sounds good, but what's this got to do with sex? What's this got to do with, 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 uh, with this ache for, for intimacy, for union? Um, yeah, what's it? I don't understand. I've never thought of connecting the idea of sex with the being in the image of God. In fact, we normally have God, anything to do with God, over there, and sex is like in a box over here. And the two, at an emotional level, we, we're a little uncomfortable about connecting them. So, what has it got to do, sex, with, with what I've just been talking about? There's a story of a Catholic priest who goes for a walk one night, a prayer walk, and um, as he as he walks in the garden, he stumbles across a couple in in the bottom of his garden, and and they're having a couple having sex, a young couple, and he stumbles actually stumbles over them, and uh, it's only a made up story, but it's a story. Stumbles over them, and everyone's very embarrassed. And he's saying, excuse me, and, and going away. And he then comes back and he says, just one question, just one question. And it's a starry night, big starry clear night. And they're having sex under the stars. And he says, I just want to ask you one thing. And that's this, what is what you're doing now got to do with the stars? Anything? And that's the question for us. What has as having sex which is very physical almost animal like it at times in it in the way it looks has this got anything to do with with the stars with God with being made in the image of God it's the question isn't it in our story the answer is yes that's why it's a holy fire that's why it causes so much trouble that's why in Eden at the moment of our fall, the very first response was to hide our sex, the instruments of our sexual intimacy from each other because something had gone profoundly wrong in God's order for this world and for his human beings. Do you remember shame is a hiding, it's a lessening, a diminishing of the self and stupidly Adam hides from God thinking you won't see him but before that he hides from his wife and she hides 
from him, their most intimate self-giving bit. Do you remember at the end of chapter 2, it says, and Adam knew his wife, he, and, and they knew no shame, and there the creation narratives end, and they knew no shame. It's interesting. It ends on this note that they knew no shame, one flesh. He knew his wife, and they knew no shame. That's almost the, the last thing the creation writer wants to say. And suddenly now, as we disobey God, as we seek to be as gods, knowing good and evil, making the rules, autonomous, the self makes law to itself, you see? Immediately, this repercussions in, in shame, and we, we hide and feel less and relationally broken from each other. So we hide from God, hide from each other, because you can no longer trust each other. This man in a moment will be saying, the woman you gave me, she made me do it. You see? What a terrible... Adam knew his wife, they knew no shame, they were perfectly happy and at a stroke, the woman you gave me, she made me do it. Now, the woman, when he looks at me, this man, does he, does he love me now? Or does he want me? Is this a self-giving love? Or is it a taking thing? So we cover ourselves and hide from one another. And so we know that sex is, is a holy fire. The first thing our, our, our fall does is, is it disrupts this intimacy with each other. Um, it, it causes us so much trouble. It ruins the career of pastors. It troubles the years of, of teenagers, the guilt um, it screws us up in all kinds of ways. Sex, it's a holy fire. It's a big part of our lives. So, yes, it, in our story, it does have something to do with, with the stars, with God. And in a way, I think this culture knows that. The Me Too movement is all about saying sex is important. It's a, a holy fire, you know? You don't play it with it. You don't oppress, you, you safeguard this thing. Well, that's our story. We think it is a holy fire. It's actually something to do with God. Well, in what way? Well, you see, let's go back to this notion that we are image bearers. What does being an image bearer have to do with, um, with sex? And, you know, um, Paul says in, in Ephesians 5, this is a great mystery. And we, we shouldn't be worried that we, that there is a mystery about this, that, that we have to, we, every I and every T, every I isn't dotted and every T crossed, there is a mystery, it's a great mystery. Um, but I don't worry about that, I don't understand black holes, I don't understand multiverses, I don't really understand so much about um, relativity theory, if I'm honest. So I, I'm okay with mystery. It simply tells me that there's, there's a reality there that I can't entirely explain, but that God tells me is good. And so, so there's a mystery, but let's try and unpack it. What has is, what is our sexual experience as human beings got to do with being made in the image of God? Well, let's think about being made in the image of God. The clue is, let's look to the one in whose image we are made. And what do we know about God? First, two things as we begin to rustle the, the leaves of the Bible. First, he is a ruler. He is a creative, glorious ruler. And so we read in Ephesians, in, in, in Genesis 1, what did he say? Let them rule. He created them, male and female, in his own image. He said, let them rule. He rules, now they bear his image. Let them rule. And that is the seeds of my greatness, and that's the seeds of your greatness, your individual greatness. The gifts that God has given you, that you bear into his world, is because you're made to rule as he rules. 
But as we rustle the pages of our Bible, we see he's a great ruler, but then we see the second thing about him. He's not only a ruler. Any idea what the word is next? Well, he's a, he's a lover. <coughs> it's the way he is. That is his way of being. That is who he is, a lover. He loves, loves, loves. That is our God. And, and, and there are lots of ways of thinking about God's love. But just for time's sake, let's take three. Clearly it's a passionate love. His love is passionate. I mean, it's like he wants you. He desires you. He seeks union with his people at the most intimate sense that leaves Paul saying in the end, I tell you, I hasn't seen, nor ear heard, nor the mind of man conceived what God has in store for those who love him. And God desires us. And, and we see this over and over in the scriptures, don't we? It's also a faithful and a fruitful love, fruitful love and we'll come on to that. But let's look at passionate. Isaiah 62, 5. <laughs> For your maker is your husband. As the bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. So, as the Bible begins to describe what God's love is like, it very quickly begins to use the metaphor of marriage to describe his love and to characterise his love. So what are a married couple, he says? What are a married couple doing on their wedding night in the intimacy and the joy of their union? They delight in one another and God delights over us. And, and indeed, this notion of marriage that's used in the Old Testament, the point here is, it isn't just the contractual side. It's not just the signing the piece of paper, the covenantal side. It is the emotional, it is the passion of marriage that, that, that's used to describe God's love for us. Do you see that? Look at this one in Ezekiel. Later as I passed by and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you. Your breasts had formed and your hair had grown. And you became mine. Now, this is almost slightly embarrassing to read. It's very intimate. And as God reveals the nature of his love for us, he reaches for the metaphor of marriage. And not simply for its covenant, but for its delight, its passion. So it's passionate, but, well, it's marriage, so that means it is a faithful love. His love is, by its nature, a for better, for worse. Do you have that phrase in your culture? You marry someone for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. It's a forever and everlasting love that is bound to us in the covenant of his grace. That's like a marriage. And so he says, that's the only love I do. He doesn't do any other loves. He does faithful love. And the picture of this faithful love is what we call marriage. And then as this picture continues to thread its way into the New Testament, what does John the Baptist, as one of the earliest titles used of Jesus, he describes him as John 3, bridegroom. <coughs> the bridegroom. The, the bridegroom has come for his bride. Jesus walks. And Paul, looking at this great mystery, and this is a great mystery, but this one flesh thing, this couple in intimate embrace, faithfully bound to one another, he says, I, I look at this couple who are just married, and I say, it points to Christ and the church, Ephesians 5, 32. They are signposting something. And so it, it's not simply that, 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 that this is a, a kind of a metaphor, just a way of talking about it. It appears that 
that God has etched into human flesh the central drama of the gospel so that when a man and woman step forward and she says I do or I will and he says I will you see the gospel in flesh and this is a great mystery it refers to passion the faithful love of Christ for the church and Paul's saying there as you look at this couple in in church as you think about their their, their intimacy together you, they are pointing in their embodied love to the end of human history what, what are we told is the end of human history in uh, Revelation we're told that it is the marriage supper of the Lamb we will rejoice at the very end time because we've arrived at the marriage supper of the Lamb the thing to which this couple point has come and uh, it's an extraordinary truth and I, I always want to say don't ever look at a married couple because in their faithfulness to one another they iconize, they point to the, the gospel itself and a wedding isn't simply, I, you, some people say I'm having a wedding and we've got lots of non-Christian relatives so I've asked someone to preach the gospel that's a good thing to do but the point is this preaches the gospel as well it sets before people a picture of, of Christ's love for his people and the bride's response to him of commitment, trust. And in some ways, a, a couple celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary iconize God's love even more than the couple getting married because theirs is a celebration a promises kept not simply promises made this should be a big celebration in our churches because we have lots of examples around us of God's faithful enduring love and we say what you do reminds me of who God is and I give thanks for that so passionate faithful and then finally fruitful his love is fruitful it as, as he calls creation into being and he says that's good he loves what he sees and he calls for more and more and each day he calls forth more and he then he makes male m m humans male and female and he says to them make more be fruitful more image bearers more rule more beauty and and so this wonderfully that the, this the, this sexual intimacy that he gives us as human beings is intrinsically ordered toward life toward the creation of new life and so we bear the image of of God and and I see young Christians particularly young men Christians who seem to be aping the world in in waiting until their late 30s to get married and 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 they 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 want the world for so many years to suit them and they and and I want I want to say to them grow up shoulder the responsibilities of of loving a girl of of being a father of taking on the commitments of marriage and this in itself will grow you up because those commitments form us. It, it's, it's God's gift to us as he binds us together in love in these relationships. I, I think what we've got to acknowledge is that we are not in that garden. Um, that as God intended us to be, we are now in a very different world. Not all can or indeed should in today's world in the changed circumstances of a fallen world not all can or should be married Jesus wasn't married Paul was not married given the contingencies of the gospel Paul says it's even better 
for some not to be married given the the realities of of the need to have people who are mobile and who can spread the gospel and don't have those family responsibilities so not all can or should be married for some to be honest it just doesn't work out and there's a pain there and every time I talk about this I and I talk about fruitfulness and faithfulness I'm just aware in a room of people there'll be someone saying this sounds great but my wife left me and 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 so it, it, it's hard so in a fallen world our relationships are strained and things don't work out and not all marriages work and 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 they go wrong and sex is not all it's cracked up to be and goes wrong and is awkward and there's impotence and all of the other <coughs> issues that we struggle with in this fallen world some struggle with with same-sex desire from their earliest experience in this fallen different world we're not in a world pictured by Eden the world intended by God and so I'm, I'm always aware of the, of the hurt as as one sets before people what God's intention is that the hurt that that leaves people there's couples saying order toward children not in our case it wasn't we can't have kids and we've been trying for years and it breaks our heart and others feel even in their being gendered a sense of dissonance and pain that they, they they're a boy but they just don't feel right and I know this opens up a big area but what I what I want to say is we're living in a, in a broken fallen world and that is our story but our story is really that we are learning notwithstanding that because of the gospel because God came to reclaim his own people we're learning to be his creatures all over again. We're learning as a community to live as close as possible to in ways that God has intended and support one another in that quest. So what I want to say though is it's just a, a word about being single and then I will stop. Um, I, I, I never, I, I'm always sad when I hear people talk about singleness as if, it's, as if there's a binary that the world divides into married and single. Um, friends, we're all single for vast sections of our lives. Many of us are single for the first three decades. I have a 50% chance, unless I'm killed with my wife in some crash a 50 percent chance of being single again and i will learn again the truths that we're about to talk about so it doesn't all just you know that there's married people then there's single people and, and this is a problem here we need to talk about no what what we need to talk about is how each of us navigates these different phases of life being single being married What I want to suggest is that both single and married people are called to say yes to God's plan, to the thing to which marriage points, which is the union of Christ and the church and the kind of love that God has and the kind of image that we bear. Both single and married people are called in their different ways, in their bodies, to say yes to that plan. Now what do I mean? Let's take a married man if you're here and you're a married man and you've been married several years and things are a bit tough in the marriage and your secretary is so she listens to you so sympathetically and she's so young and attractive and you're you're leaning closer and you're right on the edge I, I just want to say that if you say no to that affair that breaking of your promises if you say no to that because you think I'm in the image of God he doesn't break his promises I will be faithful to mine no matter how hard that is if you say no to that affair you say yes to the thing to which marriage points which is the faithfulness of God the love of God his love's faithful and if you're a single woman and I had a woman come up to me once she said, I've had, I'm in an office it's the kind of office that has office parties and he said, she said, I could have slept with 
people could have had one night stands and I want to say look if in your saying no to those things because he doesn't have one night stands his love isn't like that in your single state in your chaste bodily discipleship you're saying yes to the thing to which marriage points which is that God doesn't have one night stand his love is faithful his love is expressed in the covenant of marriage and so your chasteness is saying yes to what marriage points to and indeed in your chasteness you point to the state that we'll all be in one day there'll be no marriage in heaven Jesus said why because the thing to which it points has come the marriage supper of the lamb now that's very mysterious I don't understand it I really don't but I don't understand black holes or relativity so I'm okay with that because I do know that I hasn't seen or ear heard or the mind of man conceive what God has in store and I trust him for that and I want to say if you're single here in the beautiful bodily chasteness of your discipleship you say no you're saying yes with your body you're not asexual you're saying yes to the thing to which marriage points and you're supporting couples in their marriages to be faithful as well with your chasteness so you see we're all in this together and it means that Ed Shaw who's one of my pastors written a book the plausibility problem he's same-sex attracted and he does, he's very happy with me saying this because he's said it himself on, on, on video many times. But, but he says, it wasn't a cho- do you think this is a choice? Do you think I'd choose this? Um, he, he, he said when, when in the playground other little boys run after the girls, I'm pulled to the little boys. That's just my reality, my experience, you see. And, and what we want to say to somebody like him, because there'll be somebody who has something of that experience here, male or female, is, is want to say, when you say no, when you say no to that desire, and you hold yourself as he does, chastely, celibate, gosh, what a tough call. In, in, an, you know, in a culture of entitlement, you can have it all. To say no, you can't. Not if you want to live as God's creature, not if you want to point to the thing to which marriage points. But in his chasteness, he puts on display something of the faithfulness of God, in his own image bearing of God. And Sam Albury, who's another pastor I know, he says, I may miss out on the appetizer, not married, he's same sex attracted. I may miss out on the appetizer, he says, but we will all be at the main course, the thing to which marriage points. We'll all be in the stars because every appetite, every desire, whether it's for food, whether it's for beauty, whether it's the joy of sexual intimacy, all of these incomplete attitudes in this world that are held back in a Romans 8 sense, will find their fulfillment, their completion, their satisfaction in him. And I think that's a wonderful kind of picture. And that's, that, that is our story. The trouble is, it doesn't fall into neat sound bites. So, it's a story we have to live as much as tell we've got to put on display its goods its benefits so that our churches become places for damaged broken people who are learning that when we live in God's ways together and support one another in that we we begin to flourish so for us freedom is when we live in harmony with who we truly are, with our design. This is a culture that understands identity. Well, tell this culture what your identity is. You're an image bearer, and so you're learning to live in harmony with that core. Flourishing is by way of self-sacrifice for us, not self-fulfillment. And the world doesn't understand that. Friends, it's never understood it. 
when Christians marched out with a cross, nobody understood that. It's crazy religion we have. But we believe that's the way to life. For us, fairness is as much about our duties to one another in fellowship, in the family of the church that works together to protect families, to safeguard marriages, to look after single people, then, then we're being truly letting the justice of God, letting the waters roll. And uh, I've set this out in more detail in, in this book. And what I, I hope, I've, what I want to try and do is just inspire you to tell a better story. And I'll finish with this story. It's a story of, oh by the way, never, just a reminder, we, we will never, we will never give this up. We want to say sorry, we want to say thank you. We will never give it up because God's given it for the life of the world. And people before us have stood up for truth. This, maybe it's our turn now to do the same. But I end up with a story which is about the sirens. You remember the sirens were um, in Greek mythology there were these creatures, the sirens, who lured sailors onto the rocks because they had the most beautiful singing voice. And there's the story here of, um, who's this again? Odysseus. Odysseus, yeah, or Ulysses, I think was his other name. Odysseus, he wanted to hear the sirens and so he instructed his men to put wax in their ears and to strap himself to the mast and then when they went past and the sirens tried to lure them onto the rocks immediately the beauty of their singing he, he orders his men to cut him free to to to, um, to, to, to set him down so that he can respond to the music and they can't hear him thankfully and carry on rowing um, and you can do that. You can, in response to the sexual revolution, you can strap yourself to the mast and say, no, 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 keep me strapped here, no, more pornography seminars, and I do believe pornography seminars are important, by the way, but just what we're against, what we're against, what we're against, strapped to the mast. Or there's another story of the sirens, and it's the story of Orpheus, greatest musician in the world, who falls under the spell of the sirens as he passes with his men and he sees them beginning to turn the boat to the rocks and his own heart pulled so he gets out of his lyre and he starts singing and with the beauty of his own song he he drowns out the sound and that is the scale of the challenge for us we've not only got to inspire ourselves with the truth of what we believe we've got to incarnate it and sing a better song to the world and that's the challenge I think that God puts before us.